kind of like uh, Tim said, there's we we're, we're not the the experts, and some of this stuff's been done through trial and error, and we've changed what we've been doing five times, and sometimes that's from what we've found or someone giving us suggestions. So by all means, any of this stuff, don't think that this is how you have to do it. And if you see something and go, oh, that's a, I think that's garbage. Why don't you try this? Let us know because we'll, we'll be happy to try it. And so hopefully use this as a bit of a guide. But yeah, again, this is just our learnings and our, our findings. Um, so I thought I'd talk a bit about kind of, I suppose Tim covered a bit of the permeable uh, footpaths, but we kind of like Tim, Tim does all the smarts and I'm like, let's just build stuff bigger and deeper. Uh, so I thought, let's just do a permeable road in, in some spots. And so this, this is probably a bit of our standard design that we've arrived at now, like I said, probably after a fair few different trial, trial and errors with the kind of about 300 deep. So the same as you'd be building a road with asphalt, with screenings. In the roads, we've been using the Adbri paver. Um, we've used, been using this GeoWeb cell, some under drainage, and I thought I'd go through about kind of just how we're building it and, and why we've arrived at that. So one of the roads we'll go out to today in Kegworth Road is where we've just stripped up the road. A, a lot of the roads in Mitcham don't really have any under base, so it doesn't take much and you're down to the, down to the clay. And so to work around with the trees, um, like one of Tim's suggestions is let's, let's not roll or compact the subgrade. Let's just dig it up. So pretty much kind of what you see dug up there, we just start building sh straight on top of that uh, just to allow some of those tree roots to get in. Um, and so what, what we typically do then is once we've stripped down to that subgrade, we'll chuck down a bit of geo fabric and in this case as well, we've put in some under drainage. Sometimes we'll use the mega flow. In this, we wanted a bit more because I've, I've been using the permeable. Uh, you heard Tim talk a bit about the infiltration rates and its capture. In some spots on grade, I've been using it as more as one giant graded inlet pit. Or in this instance, we had a road that in uh, the end of winter was just getting destroyed through springs coming up on the grade. You could see this was the state of it, and every time they go repair, it would do this. Um, and we had some stormwater problems as well, so it's like, well, what about we use permeable paving to get water coming up out of the springs, like so we don't look like idiots going there every year, just rebuilding the same bit of road and having the, the same problem again. And then we, what we'd started putting down is this uh, geo cell or the geo web kind of plastics um, and this was one of the first roads we did uh, in the really reactive clay we got a few kind of localized depressions in the pavement once we did it and I th I'd seen this kind of years ago in the US where they'd go into the swamp roads down those areas in the, the south e southeast of the US and like throw this down over swamp, throw some screenings on it, and then half an hour later you're driving trucks on it. And we thought, well, what about we, I know it's just used a lot in like bank stability or some other things. What about we chuck this under just to it, distribute the load and increase the like bearing strength capacity of some of these clays? Um, because it, particularly on a few of these, we were getting the geotech done before we're doing it. And a lot of these are like a CBR of, two or three so you're basically the the, the soil's given you nothing for strength and if you were doing a conventional pavement it'd be like a four or five hundred mil thick um, to get any strength out of it but that's one where yeah we've dug down 300 throw that in then we'll just throw in some screenings straight over the top um, and we will we will kind of run a whacker over to kind of just make sure it's all in and level, but typically, typically everything kind of self-settles. Um, it is a, a couple day process by the time you've dug it out, put the stuff in, put the screenings in and lay the pavers. So we've found as well, you'll see when we go past one of the sites today, we'll just put in like a steel beam or some woodwork with some pins down on the side. Yes, it doesn't have capping for those kind of safety conscious amongst us, but 
Uh, that allows us to just do half the road at a time and then we go into the other half and start to build it in. But then literally that's just, once it's reached to that, just chucking on pavers. And that's the kind of finished look. And we're, this is one of the sites we'll go to again today that shows kind of you've got the water ponding in that intersection up in the top, coming along, and then hits, hits some of the permeable in the gutter and just disappears. And certainly kind of Tim had been talking a bit about like clogging and we've found a lot of times where you're getting um, the, the leaf drop and things is kind of in this first like a couple meters where stuff gets in and breaks down and gets mashed into the pavers. And a few times I'd been out there when the street sweeper goes on and that seems to do good at just kind of sweeping a bit of the grit and dirt out the top without lifting out any stone. We, that was always one of our worries that you'd pull out some of the fines and the stone, but it doesn't seem to really do it. It just pulls off that bit of moss and the dirt at the top. And the other thing we've been then in dabbling in is the once Tim had been doing the stuff with permeable footpaths and we thought, well, why aren't we doing all, all our footpaths <laughs> permeable again? So this is probably about version Z by the iterations we'd, we'd been doing. And initially we dived out there with the best that had been doing our um, footpaths. And so we went out there and we started doing some driveways as well, but we found kind of like, is that going to be risky that eventually like the driveway is going to be the residence and if this doesn't really work out for us, is it going to be a big headache problem? So typically we've been doing all our driveways still in, in non-permeable, so best to bring in like a truckload of normal rubble and then the screenings for the footpath, but we just go through with the same paver as well, so there's no, they don't need to bring in some different different pavers or different stuff. So typically we do the footpaths, then just fill in with the permeable footpath in the middle, which is where the trees typically are anyway. And so that's, that's what, ha that was what happened as well, which probably turned us off. So by the way, that's the resident doing the hard work and that's the two graduate engineers that are standing watching, but, uh, <laughs> We went to do one of the driveways in the permeable when I think the residents driven in seeing kind of gravel and you can go in, but the problem is they're just sunk. So, so that's a, so we're like, that's it. No, no uh, permeable driveways. We'll just leave that out. Um, and one thing we're doing that's been a bit opportunistic when we can, depending on kind of like in theory, we thought this would be awesome, but really depends on the way the footpath, like we're doing it in the flat areas, but you probably still want a bit of grade to get the water into it. And then it depends on where the downpipe is. And, but we've just been taking the residential connection, putting in a T and then dropping it into the mega flow and running that under the footpath. <clears throat> and I mean, on a typical, say, if we're going a hundred mil thick base in the screenings, 20 meters long or so, you're getting just a thousand liters that would be diverted in any rainfall <clears throat> into there. So if you think if you could be doing that across just 100 properties a year, it's like you're putting in 100 rainwater tanks under the verge as retention. And I mean, so that's, a, that's one of the permeable paths. I think that's in the, the Adbri one. But I mean, to your casual person walking down the street, it doesn't, no, no one knows any different. That, that's the driveway that's impermeable. There's the, the, road, the footpath that's permeable. You don't, to the resident, there is no change in aesthetics. There is nothing that's different. And then uh, this was one on one of the jobs where we were putting it in a new footpath <coughs> and the residents still had all their sprinklers set up for watering as if it was all, all lawn. So when we noticed that when they were putting sprinklers on, it was just drenching the footpath and the driveway that used to just be gravel and where it used to go. So we got some photos. So that's after those sprinklers have all been on. And so that's obviously the permeable part of the footpath and then that's our driveway. And you can see the difference in what was just 
then landing on the driveway and sitting there and not really going anywhere. And then the footpath is still kind of bone dry or holding all the water underneath it. <coughs> but then, yeah, you say, this is all cool. But what's, a, what's it going to cost me? So we've found footpaths, you're paying about 15% extra. Um, but what that doesn't count is, say, if you're looking at some of those footpaths where Tim was doing his trial, and the pavers were lifting, and that was happening after eight to 10 years, well, if you're depreciating that as a footpath for over 80 years, well, it's not really, not really accurate, is it? So although you might be spending 15% more, what kind of whole of life cost improvement are you getting? Could you do it for a bit cheaper than the 15%? If you had someone that was saying, I don't want to spend an extra cent, you could maybe remove the geo fabric, we put it down there, but Really, we're not compacting the subgrade. Maybe you could just tuck the screenings straight on over the top. Um, we've also found the pavers to go the, the best permeable one are slightly percent more. I mean, half of that 15% is just the cost of the different paver because it's not they're not mass producing them. Uh, there's less in stock. It's, it's a bit of a, a custom thing. So. Typically, probably if every council in the state started doing 10,000 square meters of them, maybe that would be cheaper as well. And another thing we tried with, but then it seemed to be kind of people were a bit nervous about it, is uh, we we're working with Best on using some of the recycled screenings and whether they, they had some um, crushed material that uh, we thought, well, this would be a bit of a better news story if we could be using recycled product as well. Uh, so we're taking that out of the waste stream. And we actually found our normal kind of um, those 10 mil screenings had about 40, 45% air voids. And we we're getting about 50 to 55% air voids in the recycled screening. So you, that, and that's all what takes the water. So you, you could theoretically get more storage under each of those footpaths. <coughs> so our roads. A little bit more expensive, you're paying about 30% more on top and a lot of that is maybe just uh, in the labouring that you've probably got to do it at half at a time rather than just digging it up and chucking your rubble down and, and rolling everything. So there's a bit of handwork, you've obviously got people to just manually lay pavers rather than machines doing stuff. So probably again, could you do it for cheaper? Maybe you could do it without geofabric? And we're tr one, we're trying that will go past today. We're doing without geofabric. The other one, you saw photos where we did it. So um, let's see, see how that works over time. Again, you could use your recycled screenings, maybe save a few bucks. Uh, the other thing we did in the early days as well is we thought it permeable. It's got to be flat to get the water in. Um, so we had kind of like six or seven meter transition zones as you went from a crowned road coming into flat, which was all cost to dig that up, re-level it, re-asphalt, whereas now we've just been, and, and you'll see this again on one of the sites now, we've just been doing it crowned because uh, we've been keeping the curb in, like again, theoretically, you could just be going an edge plinth each side with no curb, but we, we realise that that's quite dramatic and it's about baby steps that uh, it could be alarming to the more conventional people if you said we're going to build a road with no curb. Uh, but we, we find then typically as your, as your curb gets up and the gutter flow width goes out, it all just disappears into the permeable anyway. So we're, we're just going with crown. So it seems to save a bit of cost as well without the transition. And the other thing where we've been using it as well is just in a bit of detention. Um, the site where we'll visit it today, I keep harping on about it. The construction site is one where we've got a little 225 drinking straw that runs through the properties and we haven't obtained the easement to put in the bigger pipe, so we put in a stub. Um, so for the interim, we're just building a grandiose underground detention storage typically, um, which isn't the 10 meter standard, so again, just ignore that. But we're finding if you did, say, 10 metre long, 6 metre wide road, 
you're getting about 6,000 litres and, and roughly on the cost of the permeable road, we're paying about $1.20 a litre for the storage. But say, if you wanted to get that same 6,000 litres uh, of detention storage over that 10 metres, you'd have to be putting in 900 mil diameter pipe, which who can do that these days anyway, because with the amount of services and stuff we're finding anyway. And so to do, do that same on our costings, you're looking about nearly nine grand, which is a $1.40 a litre, plus that'll be quite a bit more hassle. So in, in some ways we see it as that, well, just do that as detention retention under the road. It's a lot cheaper than putting in pipes. You get some storage. So certainly the one we're at now where we've dug it down, uh, we're thinking we'll get about 20,000 litres. Uh, th this one where it goes into the 225, so 20,000 litres of storage um, before it goes. And like Tim said, with some of these heavier clay infiltration and the theoretical one millimetre an hour from wh where we've tested it, but in some of these spots where we've got these trees and we've got some test pits, like this stuff's disappearing. I don't know where it's going, um, but you'll have water a uh, metre and a half deep in the kind of side entry pit and everything that's under that that's full and you come back the next day and it's gone. So, I don't know, it's, it's soaking away somewhere. And the other thing we've, we've <coughs> argued a bit but haven't, haven't really uh, looked at, although, although this had been coming up in that we have to do a uh, bikeway down in Kingswood and all that involves those 10 metre intersection threshold treatments and doing them in that street print where they heat up the asphalt, stamp in the kind of pattern pave look and then paint it. And that stuff is expensive. It only lasts about five or 10 years and then you're there repainting it, doing everything. So it's pretty expensive. And so we're actually putting the case forward that maybe we do all those intersection treatments in permeable paving and it can double as a bit of some stormwater benefit as well as it's cheaper. But even if you're looking at, say, conventional road seal and base, 300 mil deep, um, you've got the base, say, roughly works out to about $8 a square meter depreciation a year. But the, the big killer is that your asphalt seal is only going to last 20, 20 to 5 years. If you're looking on, on that kind of per square meter, that, that's $17 depreciation a year, and that's working on that asphalt's not gonna, how expensive is asphalt and bitumen gonna be in 20 years, 40 years? You, you're gonna be, in a road that's 80 years old, you're gonna be doing that four times. Have you looked at, say, the permeable paver surface and base, and whether this is true or not, but we value all our paved things and our permeable roads at 80 years? Maybe that's not there, but, you're paying 30% up front. It works out to about $16 a square meter depreciation a year. So if you've got the kind of financial folks saying, well, we've got to reduce our costs, we've got $25 a square meter depreciation for a normal road, and you've got 16 for permeable. So you're kind of reducing $10 every square meter in depreciation here. Bottom line. Um, so that's it, and it's cert certainly kind of, a, I think as we go around, kind of any, any questions you've got, or you could see how we've done some stuff, it might be easier once we're out there and you're seeing some things. So we'll go look at some couple permeable roads we've done, and then also permeable footpath that we did around some significant trees in Colonel Light Gardens, where like you couldn't, you couldn't breathe on these trees and we put in the permeable footpaths all around there, so last year, so. Okay. Yeah, so I know. That's all right. Um, Andrew, good question. Um, Rusty, with your uh, permeable footpaths, have yeah. our friends at NDN been through your uh, council area yet, or any of the service agencies gone through any of your big claims of permeable roads? Mm -hmm. No, or in most spots, it's already been done in a lot of these uh, where we've been doing. So 
We've been lucky that they've not gone through. And we're against strategy of yeah. general price that would have done that. Yeah. Uh, we'll see how they go. But really, we're hoping that, like, obviously you've got a lot of work to dig it up, and if you've got the geo fabric there, it'll make one, one hell of a mess from digging it up. Whereas if you didn't have the geo fabric, it'll maybe be easier that you're just lifting off the pavers, digging out. I, I, I always thought it would be easy to just be able to pour screenings back in and not have to mess around recompacting stuff, just pour your screens back into the trench and chuck the pavers, but no, that, that, that's one thing we, we've not come across. We, we did find in a couple spots where we had, in the roads particularly, where we had fairly recent water trenches or gas trenches or maybe kind of sand backfield um, uh, or other spots, and that's where we put down like a little, the tensile grid over it or it just made sure we had the geo fabric there to just stop any of that differential sediment we might get through the sand or kind of damaging their infrastructure so um with your cost benefit of your options yep um it was interesting to see like you still got a, a residual cost or a gap to the standard but I've heard that stormwater systems are, uh, you know, within field development, getting the, coming up against the need to resize stormwater infrastructure. So, is that possible? Do you think to do a scenario where you were to get all that infiltration storage in the paving versus, say, resizing the stormwater infrastructure? Yeah, well, that's the thing. The, all, this just looks straight on just face value. So, what's not included in there is that exactly and some of the water quality benefits as well. I mean, if you're just, just the flows you would be reducing from going like through what it catches, captures and retains as well as some of that exactly. Like in some of these spots um, where we've put in the permeable as well, it, it's reduced the amount of stormwater pits and pipes you've had to put in. And that, that's probably a bit of an exercise we could look at. And since then, we've, we've not had a single problem because we, we did a whole lot of intersections all in it down this street. And like they've sunk, maybe in a couple spots. If you're really looking for it, they're not ideal, but the residents love them because since then they've had no flooding. These things seem to just, so like they've got pretty big trees along there where all the permeable are, and it seems to just soak away, soak away the water, something grand. Well, that's all right. Yep. Groundwater levels vary across the Adelaide metro area, and Mitchell was quite lucky in relatively deep water tables. So, probably uh, not knowing where the water's going, probably that means where it is, is ending up. Yeah. But for a lot of other councils, that might not be uh, such a, a straightforward solution. Uh, do you do any monitoring to, to detect what changes in groundwater levels are occurring as a result? No, uh, yeah, so. The, the question was, do we do any monitoring to see just what the groundwater is doing? And no, we don't. Cause in, in one of the ones when we go to Kegworth, uh, in a couple spots, we just out of fancy did our geotech tests just slightly deeper and we're finding uh, through a lot of spots in Mitcham about a metre and a half, two metres down. We had all like gravel layers and some kind of fairly porous layers and so in some spots we've just done our leak we, leaky wells down to that and you can just pour water into it unlimited and it seems to just disappear um, and it, it, it's shallow enough that we don't think it's kind of causing any problems so no we don't we don't do any groundwater checks but might be something Thanks worthwhile the, the site the bus tour finishes up at this afternoon is a a catchment in Hawthorne that's had 180 tree net inlets installed. So there's, there's going to be some infiltration there. Um, there's a sports field right on the right side. Uh, we've got our rain gauge monitoring the winds. Uh, we've gauged the catchment to monitor the outs via the stormwater system. It would be pretty easy to monitor the bore depth. There. <coughs> something we could look at. Okay, thank you. Yeah.